to be praised. All these things we ask and we do receive in Jesus' matchless, his marvelous and miraculous name. Amen and amen. amen. amen.
belongs to Jesus. Amen. Amen. I was writing in my journal on, on January 1st, which was what? Yesterday. And I said, my wife and I were sitting at the dinner table, the breakfast table, and we were praying, Lord, what's the theme of this year? Give me my theme for this year. You could see my journal. It was victory. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God incidences. And the Spirit of the Lord is here. So what I ask you right now is, can we begin with what I call a little kingdom exercise? Amen. It's something I learned from C.S. Lewis, who began his day with two questions. No, I'm not. I'm not on the channel. Yes. C.S. Lewis began his day with two questions. One was, who's in control? Two, to whom? shall I listen to today? So would you pray with me right now? Say this with me. Lord, Lord. who is in control? control? And to whom shall I listen to today? today? Lord, thank you that you are in control. control. And thank you for the privilege that I get to listen to you today. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, that is kingdom living right there. So, without further ado, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, We're here. It's a new year. It's a new day. All things, they're they're gone, and, and we look forward to a very bright 2022. Every year, I don't know if you're like me, but, but I set these resolutions, things I promised myself, and sometimes I forget them by, by February, sometimes I don't, but, but I said, Lord, what's, what's going to be some changes in my life this year? And he, and he made it clear. I want, you, I want you to live like me. I want you to live like me. Um, I ended 2021 in a very, my heart was very heavy. I felt this weight my last command, I was part of 27, more than 27 funerals or memorials that either I conducted or I was part of. Every, everywhere from burying my friend Jeff's little daughter, Briella, who was eight years old, who died of leukemia, to losing 19 of my own Marines and sailors in training. And then last summer, uh, nine died in Afghanistan, in, in Kabul, from my regiment. And I went to all these funerals and memorials to another guy named Mike who just died at his desk to burying my own dad in July, who died at 66, who overcame COVID, got better, and went into the hospital for some surgery, and then they gave him a medication controversial medication called remdesivir, and then he died. And so that, that's how I ended my year. And then we moved here to Germany. And so there's a lot of grief, and my heart was so heavy, and we were lashing out at each other, my family. We were, there, was a, there was a lot going on, but in the midst of that, I could see that God was in control, and that, too, I should only listen to him. And so I, I don't know, if you, if you were like me, then I think you too, and if you were being honest, you would admit too that 
sometimes around like the end of the year, like the holidays, it just gets heavy. And some things, like I was, I was doing well with my intermittent fast, and I was, I was eating good. And all of a sudden, Thanksgiving hit, and my wife's an amazing cook, and I just start, things started going downhill. Right? But January is always this time. It's a fresh start. It's a new beginning. His mercies are new every morning. But there's something special about January 1st. That it's just like a reset. And God knows we need a reset. Amen. With that, I, I, I forgot to introduce my family. I, my name is Ryan, and I'm married to my best friend, and that beautiful guy right there, Jeanette. And uh, we have four children who look exactly like us. Ryder, Giselle, Kylea, and Kyler. So our family, the Barang family, uh, we, we are restored, restores on mission for King Jesus. Amen. That's all we do. This, this, what I do here in, at, at AFRICOM, and it's, it's not really my ministry, it's, it's our ministry. We just want to live this kingdom life together as a family, and people, we just, we're looking for people to do life with. We are praying. We always, like the past couple duty stations, it's like, let's visit 10 places and see where the Lord wants us to go. And, uh, and there's something special about this place here. Jesus is in this place. The Spirit flows in this place. And it seems like when we walk in here, there's, there's just a freedom to worship Jesus with reckless abandon. And we love that. So it's good to be here. Um, and then uh, yesterday, uh, I love this because there is no coincidences, right? There's only God incidences. So my good friend Rob Wilkerson, who is an amazing pastor and a good friend of mine, we're actually endorsed by the same chaplain endorsing agency called the Coalition of Spirit-Filled Churches, uh, which I just recently joined. Because growing up, I, I, I was raised on God the Father, God the Son, and, and the Holy Scriptures. And then recently, maybe like six, five, six or five years ago, God introduced me to the Holy Spirit. And I said, oh, I didn't even realize... Uh, I didn't even realize I could have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and He's set me free ever since. So I joined the Coalition of Spirit-Filled Churches, and I worship with reckless abandon now. And I was, I was a little worried because I was losing my voice because I was belting, and I was like, oh, no, I have to preach after this. But the Lord brought my voice back. So uh, Rob yesterday goes, hey, hey Ryan, uh, I, something went down. Would you, would you get up there and, and preach for me? And I said, uh, let, me, let me pray, which means, hey, hey uh, let me pray about it first. And Jeanette says, let's do this. So that's where we are here. Okay. Now, I thought, what passage could we go to to kick off this year? And I want to take you to Luke chapter 4. And in Luke chapter 4, if you're feeling what I'm feeling, right, this, this heaviness that started, I, I don't know, maybe sometime around March 2020, right? A lot of confusion, a lot of like, what's going on? Like, who can we trust? What's, what's wrong with this world? And if we live in a post-March 2020 world, then, then you would realize that, man, we, we need a Savior. Ah. And Jesus... When he began his ministry, he had a mission statement. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus had a mission statement? His mission statement is in Luke chapter 4. Okay? And in Luke chapter 4, beginning with verses 14 through oh, all the way to, to, to 28, this is his first time appearing in his hometown. Okay? So let's read this together. Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. And then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. Okay, so Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Where, where was he? Where was he at? Well, if you just back up and look at the context, he had spent 40 days in the wilderness, and he didn't eat anything. 40 days. I don't know about you, but after one day, I start to get what's called, a technical term, it's called hangry. Hungry, angry. Jesus was in the desert, in the wilderness, for 40 days. And you know why? Because he was about to launch into something new. He was about to step into something new, and he knew his life would never be the same. He's been waiting 30 years 
to prepare for the moment that he would begin his earthly ministry. So how does Jesus prepare for something huge? How should we prepare for something huge like 2022? You spend time with the Father. That's how you prepare for something big. So Jesus, because he knows his ministry is coming, he goes, I got to get away. Alone time, one-on-one with the Father. So Jesus spends 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And if we're, that's not our passage for today. But if you, just to summarize that passage, Jesus had how many temptations in the wilderness? Right? Three. And every single one of those temptations was really a temptation to take his focus off of the Father onto something else. Take his, take his eyes off of the Father onto things he might need, things he might want, things he might would be pretty cool for kickstarting a ministry, like jumping off of a temple and then landing and having Insta followers and then gaining all this fortune and fame right off the bat. But Jesus doesn't take his eyes off the Father ever. He passes the test of, nope, I don't need that bread. Right now I'm focusing on the Father. And it would be sinful to take my eyes off of the Father and onto something I legitimately need, like some bread. But for Jesus, the focus on pleasing the Father is on His eyes are on the Father, and not even bread's going to distract him. And Satan throws at him um, SMP, sex, money, power. You can have all these kingdoms. You can have everything. It can be all yours. He goes, I I don't need that. I'm focusing on the Father. And then they jump off a temple and and, and wow people and and have a booming ministry right off their bat. Jesus says, not my time right now. I'm focusing on the Father. And I think if we're like Jesus, we're tempted in those same areas. Everything is just a temptation to take your eyes off of the Father onto other things, things that don't matter. When people want to argue theology with me, I'm like, those are comfortable topics. You know the two easiest topics to talk about ever? The two easiest topics to talk about ever, religion and politics. Why? Because I can talk about religion and politics all day and never tell you what's really going on in my heart. I could talk about religion and politics all day and, and not let you know that I said something very mean to my son. Because that takes courage. That takes community. I can talk about religion and politics, what's going on. Can you believe what this person posted all day and never reveal how Jesus is trying to save me from my own idolatry in my heart? Mm-hmm. So, uh, Jesus is coming back to Galilee. He's pumped. I mean, it's as, as if he left the, the, the Panzer gospel service, right? He, he walked up. He's pumped, right? And he's coming into Galilee. He's like, 40 days, I'm filled with the Spirit. You know what happens in the Scriptures when anybody's filled with anything? Whatever they're filled with is influencing them and controlling them. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. So how do you think he acted? Full of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Amen. I learned that in 1986 in VBS. Uh-huh. But you teach kids, it, it sticks forever. Yeah, no, right? Fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Fruit of the Spirit. Jesus walked on full of Spirit. When people were angry and they wanted to kill the Apostle Paul, they were filled with wrath. And filled with wrath, they wanted to kill him. People who were jealous of Jesus, they were filled with jealousy and they tried to grab him and throw him off a cliff. See, see whatever fills you controls you. Ephesians 5.18 says this, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, which is basically a lot of bad stuff. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. I mean, yeah, I guess you could say it like this. Don't be drunk on wine, be drunk on the Spirit. Amen. Like when someone looks at you, like, man, that person's drunk on something. Yeah, drunk on the Spirit. Because love exudes out of my being. Joy, peace, patience, kindness. You're like, those people, what, those people that are worshiping like that, why are they worshiping like that? It's because they're filled with the Spirit. Yes. And what God thinks of us matters more than what man thinks of us. It took me a long time to learn that. Amen. It took me a long time to worship God with reckless abandon until I watched an, a nine-year-old girl worshiping God with reckless abandon. And I finally said, this was in Hawaii, I said, I, I, I want that. I want to be like that. So that's Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returning to Galilee, pumped up, and news about him was spreading throughout the entire vicinity. If you walk around filled with the Spirit, people will notice. Like, if people walk in here and they're full of knowledge, you kind of notice that too. At least I do. But if someone's filled with love and they walk into a room, it 
does something to the atmosphere. Like last week, we were nearly, I was teaching my, my kids what, what the little bench is. It's just to, you put it down and you kneel on it and you pray. And I felt sister here, her, her, warm, her warm touch. Like feel, I felt the spirit in you and, she, and I just felt this hand of prayer over me and thank you for doing that. You bless me. So Jesus filled the spirit. News is spreading about him because that's what news does when you're filled with the spirit. There's just something different about that guy. There's something different about that girl. Verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues and being praised by everybody. Look, at if you notice here, synagogues, this is plural. He's, he's doing this. This is his custom. And verse 16, and then he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he's returning to his hometown. And the scholars tell us that Jesus had been preaching for upwards of about one year at this point. And he's got the same message, right? Kingdom of God. Jesus came to preach about the kingdom. It, it, it wasn't even really about the local church. It's about the kingdom. You see, the, the local church doesn't have a kingdom. The kingdom has a local church to do, its, to do its thing, to do its work. So it's all about the kingdom of God. Jesus is all about the kingdom of God. So he's preaching about the kingdom of God in all these different cities, and then he comes back to his hometown. Now, I know what that feels like, because my last duty station was the city that I grew up in. Lived there for a long time. And so to come back 15, 20 years later, it was so interesting. Because people that saw me as a little kid, well, I'm still little, but I'm not no longer a kid. You know what I mean? When I saw them, when I came back years later, they're like, oh, my gosh, you're a pastor now. Let's, let's hear you preach. And I bet as, as Jesus came back to his hometown, they're like, isn't that Joseph's son? Dude, he's, he's going he's gonna to preach. Let's all go show up. I bet he had a packed house. And he's showing and words spreading about him. Um, he's teaching in their synagogues. Okay, 16, verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as usual, so Jesus was a, a, a synagogue kid, a church kid. It's just, he just, it was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, traveling rabbis, this was their custom. When they would go around, it'd be like, oh, there's a traveling rabbi. Would you like to preach, rabbi? Teacher, teach us something from the word. Open up, this, open up the word. Verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. Now, some people debate about this. They say, because in, in the ancient synagogue system, which they still do to this very day, they, have, they follow what's sort of like what the liturgical, cards, uh, tur- liturgical church calls a, a lectionary. So it's a set schedule of scriptures. But here... The Greek word says that Jesus found the place where it was written. Now, I don't really care if it was given to him, like you will preach on Isaiah, or if Jesus, tapping into his godness, knows exactly what he wants to preach at a certain time. I don't really care. The point is, he found in the scriptures a place to read. Right. Now, this is where he's going to blow them away. Because yeah. this is possibly the greatest sermon. This was the greatest sermon ever preached in the world. This is the very first Christian sermon here in Nazareth. And so he found the place, and then he starts reading from the prophet Isaiah, which if you understand the Jewish people, they've been waiting for the Messiah for a long time. And they've been waiting for a long time. Like, when is this Messiah going to come? Like, this place is oppressed by the Romans. Like, when is our Savior going to come and release us from the oppression of this, of this tyranny, of this corrupt government? When are they going to come? If you look back like every decade it seems to it seems to be the same questions we see still have i mean 80 years ago in this land that we live in called germany weren't we praying the same thing weren't the people praying the same thing like when are we going to be released from this oppression of these crazy people i mean and in the 60s it's like when are we going to be released from the oppression of having different color skin it was 60s that was like yesterday Mm -hmm. and then and then today there's still oppression here today of all different kinds. So Jesus comes here, and he starts reading this passage. This is, this is scripture here. Listen to verse 18. Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release or freedom to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free the oppressed 
and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I counted five things in Jesus' mission statement. You want to get all military? Five operational objectives. <laughs> Jesus operates on five operational objectives. If you want to know what Jesus is all about, look at his mission statement. One, preaching the good news to the poor. Preaching the good news to the poor. Well, who's poor? I know nobody in here is poor because if you have clothes on your back and you ate dinner last night, you're not poor. Amen. You're not. If you have a dollar in your pocket, you're part of the, the top wealth in the world. I've seen poor. I'm, I am not poor because I have a dollar in my pocket. I've seen poor. I've gone to, back to my, my, where my parents grew up in the Philippines, and I've walked in huts, and all they're doing is gathering around a table, and all they have is rice. Well, that's, that's poor. But sometimes Jesus, rather than talking about the temporary things here and now, he's going way beyond that and talking about eternal things. If you look in Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, I'll read it to you, blessed are the poor in, in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. See, poverty goes way beyond how much money's in our pocket. There's the poor in spirit. And Jesus has come to preach the good news to the poor. I think that applies to everybody. Amen. To preach the good... What's, what's the good news? What is the good news? It's the gospel. And the word gospel is the good news. Now, you can't have good news without bad news. Just like you can't have hot without cold. Just like you can't have light without darkness. Because you can't have good news without the bad news. Well, what's the bad news? What's the bad news? Well, I'm sure if I were to open up any of your journals or diaries, there's a lot of bad news in there. I mean, look at my journal. You can look at my journal. I, I, you, you, can, you can look at it. I got no secrets. Right? One, one entry said, if Jesus is real, why do I feel like this? Why is life such a grind? These are straight quotes from my journal. Why am I struggling so much? Lord, I thought this, kind, I thought this sin was done with. Why is it back? The good news is that Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He died. He was buried for three days. And he rose again from the dead to conquer all of that. So all those bad things, the bad news is no longer my identity. The good news is my identity is in Christ. And just like that song that we sang says, even when I don't feel like he's working, he never stops. Even though I don't see it, he never stops. Amen. I mean, I was losing it when the, when the choir was singing that song because it becomes real to me. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. And I don't feel like, Jesus, if I'm, can I be honest with you? I don't feel like he's working in me all the time. Sometimes I look at my own sin and I go, oh, that's still there? And Jesus reminds me, even when you don't feel like it, I am working. Amen. Preaching good news to the poor. The gospel is what we should be preaching to ourselves every day, preaching to each other every day. I sent my, my pastor back home. I sent Jared, Pastor Jared a note. He, go, he basically told me he wants to preach the gospel he wants me to preach the gospel to myself until I hear the Lord's voice, until I hear the voice of the Lord going, I love you. That's your identity. That's your identity. So Jesus, right, preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives. It's the word freedom. Freedom was another theme that the Lord gave me for this year. Freedom. Proclaiming freedom for the captives. Now, who's in captivity? Who's in bondage? Everybody who has unforgiveness in your heart, you are enslaved to that bitterness. Jesus came so that we would be set free from that bitterness, so that we can live a life of forgiveness. Someone told me once, the definition of forgiveness is walking out of a jail cell to realize that the door was never locked. Because Jesus said, I already unlocked it and I threw away the key. There's nothing in there. What, what are you doing in there? Jesus calls us out of that type of captivity into freedom. That's number two. 
Three, to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. Well, who's blind? All of us. It'd be all of us who can't see what God is doing. There's a sign in our house that says, if I ever don't see the glory, then take my eyes off of my hands. If I can't see something, it's because I'm covering my own eyes. And we're just scratching the surface here. Jesus is very deep, but I'm just saying that I'm just covering his five operational objectives in a, in a fast way. So recovering sight to the blind of th- uh, for to set free the oppressed. Man, uh, Jesus is a freedom fighter. He's a true freedom fighter. The disciples might have wanted to be freed from the oppression of the Romans, but Jesus is looking way past that into the spiritual bondage, into the spiritual shackles. Because he goes, I've, I've already died for that. I've picked up the tab. I left the tip. There's nothing for you to do but to just walk in the victory, to walk in the freedom, which is another great song, the, the victory song. Amazing. And this is the last one, the fifth one, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What is that? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, if you, if you look at Leviticus 25, the year of the Lord's favor was also called the year of Jubilee. Now check this out. You're going like, to love this. The year of Jubilee, which Jesus is talking about here, is a time of forgiveness. Now let me just read you the scriptures here in Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus 25.10. You are to, to consecrate in the 50th year and proclaim freedom in the land for all its inhabitants. Jesus is all about freedom. It will be your jubilee when each of you is to return to his property and each of you to his clan. Verse 11, the 50th year will be your jubilee. You are not to sow or reap what grows by itself or harvest until untended vines. It is to be holy to you because it is the jubilee that you may eat its produce directly from the field. The 50th year... I did some, uh, some research here. The 50th year was a time for people to release everybody from their debts, yes. which is the definition of forgiveness. Right. What does it mean to forgive? It means to take someone's debt and say, you no longer owe me. Instead of, hey, you owe me. Hey, you said something bad to me. You owe me an apology. In Jesus' mind, there's no more owing. Yes, you, you don't owe me a thing. You know, you know why I'm free? Because I'm free from you, and I don't need anything from you. And now I'm freed up to love you. Amen. You know why I'm free? Because I'm free from me. I'm free because I'm free from me, because Jesus set me free, so I don't owe myself anything. You see, guilt is anger directed towards myself, wishing I would have did something different. Anger is my, is my anger towards you, thinking that you owe me something. You see, jealousy is anger towards God, thinking that he owes me something. Like, God, why couldn't you make me five foot five instead of five foot one? Like, he doesn't owe me anything. So I can actually forgive God by letting him off the hook. God, you don't owe me a thing. Everything you give me is by grace. Jealousy is looking at other people and saying, and the world owes me something. My job owes me something. I wanted a little cool ribbon that's this color instead of that color. But when you live life free, debt-free, nobody owes you a thing. And you're, f- you're completely free to love. I have a list of things that my wife owes me. It's, it's like this long and it's blank. It's a blank piece of paper. right? And, and, I, and I have that blank piece of paper to remind myself my wife doesn't owe me anything. Not a thank you, nothing. My kids don't owe me anything. Truly. So I'm free to love them and not expect anything in return. It's not a quid pro quo relationship. We work as unto the Lord, so our jobs don't owe us anything. We're not working for whoever your boss is anyways. We're working for the Lord. And our treasure is in? So let's just have 2022 be a year of canceling all debts. Would that be cool? Let's just cancel every debt. Like if anybody... If anybody has ever wronged you, why don't we just let Jesus forgive them through us? You see what I'm saying? It's not like Jesus forgive that person. It's no, it's Jesus forgive them. Okay, you can use my mouth. You can use my tone of voice. You can use my language. Okay, Lord, I'll just be the conduit of your grace, mercy, love, and peace. 
and you get out of the way, you really die to yourself, and you let Jesus love people through you. Let's let 2022 be that. This year of Jubilee was a, a time to set slaves free, give away land, and rest. It was a year of rest. Because when the land is overworked, it stops producing fruit. But when they took a year off for the land to rest, it came back fruitful. Maybe it's time, too, for us to rest in Christ, to rest, and to bear fruit after our rest. Okay, so Jesus gives these five operational objectives, right? And then he rolls up the scroll, and he gives it back to the attendant. Now, if you, if you study Jewish um, history, he's supposed to read more. This is the shortest sermon ever. I mean, he reads one, two, he's supposed to read three verses, and it's, it's a synagogue. He doesn't even finish three verses. He reads uh, just over two, and he goes, I got to cut it off right there, because he's quoting Isaiah 61. I got to cut it off there, so he can say this. Today, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. That's bold. That's bold. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. When a Jewish rabbi sat down, it meant, pay attention now because I'm about to do the teaching. And then he says this, today the scriptures have been fulfilled in your hearing. That's a mic drop moment. If anybody's paying attention, they're going, wait a minute, the sermon was so good. But he just said he was the person in the text of Isaiah. This guy's claiming to be the Messiah. And then he goes on. I'll just skim the rest. He starts talking about these non-Jews that were healed, right? Meaning that this type of freedom, this type of healing, this type of love is going to extend past one certain ethnic group into all the world, and they get very upset. He ends by talking about in Elisha's time, there were many people in Israel who had leprosy, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Naaman the Syrian, a non-Jew? Verse 28, when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They were enraged. You imagine that? Like, I go back to my hometown, I preach, and everybody was so mad that they got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. I've preached some bad sermons before, but I've never been tried, nobody's ever tried to throw me off a cliff. This is the greatest sermon met with the greatest rejection ever. If you're feeling rejected, you're in good company because Jesus knows what it, like, what it feels like to be rejected. He got rejected by his hometown. But when it's not your time, you'll never die. When it's not your time to die, you cannot die. If it is your time to die, you're going to die. You see, my dad, it was his time to die. So I struggle with a little bit of regret, like, oh, my dad would have only lived if they didn't do, if they didn't do this. If they, if, and I, my mind started going crazy. And then I realized my dad's favorite verse, Hebrews 12, 9. It is appointed for man to die once and after that to face judgment. So there's no surprises for Jesus. There's no surprises for God. And it wasn't Jesus' time, so verse 30, he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Can you imagine that? I always think of Jesus as like some sort of, in this scene, a ninja. Like they're trying to grab him and he's like, nope, 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 nope. And he just walks through and they're like, what? What happened? It's your fault. You were supposed to throw him over. No, it was your fault. Well, I tried to grab, and then that's it, right? You know, what was really good this, this Christmas was to, was to watch the series, The Chosen. Raise your hand if you've watched The Chosen. It is life-changing. I've seen a lot of Jesus films. This one does a great job of portraying how Je the humanity and the kindness of Jesus. It's, it's amazing. And, and in scenes like this, they portray a very a human Jesus. He was kind. And when his disciples are fighting amongst each other, it's like the gang is always ganging up on Matthew, but Jesus comes in and he reads him, the he says the Beatitudes, and blessed are you when you're persecuted for my sake. So in wrapping this up, we can see Jesus cares a lot about freedom. 
and to live life free in Christ is the same thing as living life in the kingdom. See, because in the kingdom of God, this is just temporary. I'm actually not a citizen of earth. I'm a citizen of the kingdom. I'm a citizen of heaven. So things that happen here, I don't really care because my citizenship is not here. When my household goods arrived and, and two boxes uh, didn't show up, I was kind of upset for a little bit. Then, I, then God reminded me, hey, we'll store up treasures here on, on earth. <laughs> Where moth and rust destroy. Your citizenship is in heaven. Jesus cares about our, our freedom. His, his mission statement is all about freedom. I'll close with this verse. What is freedom? What is freedom? Who is free? Look at, first, look at 2 Corinthians 3.17. I love this. I love this. 2 Corinthians 3.17. 3, now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You see, freedom is not the absence of something, but rather the presence of someone. And I don't know if you're like me, but I I tend to say, man, I still have this struggle in my life. And if we ever do coffee, I'll tell you about, I'll I'll tell you everything that I'm going through. Because I got no secrets, because Jesus set me free, right? I tend to look at myself and say, I'm still struggling with this. I'm still angry about this. Therefore, I'm not free. And God says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I am in you. My spirit is in you. Therefore, you are free, regardless of how you feel. Because even when you don't feel it, I'm working. Even when you don't see it, I'm working. I never stop. I never stop working. You are free. Walk in freedom. Brothers and sisters, walk in freedom because Christ has set us free. Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And we're to live free in such a way that the world sees us and goes, there's something different about that person. They're living free. Nobody owes them anything. That's weird. Why do they forgive so freely? It's because Jesus' mission was to set me free, and he did it. And Jesus is undefeated in all of his matches, which is another lyric from one of the songs, right? He's undefeated. Can I pray for us? Jesus, we thank you that you came here to set the captives free, yes, Lord. to give sight to the blind, yes, Lord. to preach freedom, to preach the gospel to the poor in spirit, and all those things, God. And as we step into 2022, Lord, we choose to be on mission with you. Yes, Lord. Lord, in 2022, we refuse to be distracted by everything the world is throwing at us and to keep our eyes focused on the Father, to stay on mission with you and to proclaim the freedom in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in your wonderful, powerful, and holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.